Chapter 9 As Long as the Grass is Green Buy Land They Ain't Making Any More of the Stuff Will Rogers What do Indians want? Great question. The problem is, it's the wrong question to ask. While there are certainly Indians in North America, the Indians of this particular question don't exist. The Indians of this question are the Indian that Canada and the United States have created for themselves. And as long as the question is asked in that way, there will never be the possibility of an answer. Better to ask what the Lubicon Cree of Alberta want, or the Brantford Mohawk of Ontario, or the Zuni of New Mexico, or the Hoopa of Northern California, or the Klingit of Alaska. But I'd just as soon forget the question entirely. There's a better question to ask. One that will help us to understand the nature of contemporary North American Indian history. A question that we can ask of both the past and the present. What do whites want? No, it's not a trick question, and I'm not being sarcastic. Native history in North America, as writ, has never really been about Native people. It's been about whites and their needs and desires. What Native peoples wanted has never been a vital concern, has never been a political or social priority. The Lakota didn't want Europeans in the Black Hills, but whites wanted the gold that was there. The Cherokee didn't want to move from Georgia to Indian Territory, Oklahoma, but whites wanted the land. The Cree of Quebec weren't at all keen on vacating their homes to make way for the Great Whale Project, but there's excellent money in hydroelectric power. The California Indians did not ask to be enslaved by the Franciscans and forced to build that order's missions. What do whites want? The answer is quite simple, and it's been in plain sight all along. Land. Whites want land. Sure, Whites want Indians to disappear, and they want Indians to assimilate, and they want Indians to understand that everything that whites have done was for their own good, because native people, left to their own devices, couldn't make good decisions for themselves. All that's true, from a white point of view at least. But it's a lower order of true. It's a spur-of-the-moment true, and these ideas have changed over time. Assimilation was good in the 1950s, but bad in the 1970s. Residential schools were the answer to Indian education in the 1920s, but by the 21st century, governments were apologizing for the abuse that Native children had suffered at the hands of Christian doctrinaires, pedophiles, and sadists. In the 1880s, the prevailing wisdom was to destroy Native cultures and languages so that Indians could find civilization. Today, the non-Native lament is that Aboriginal cultures and languages may well be on the verge of extinction. These are all important matters, but if you pay more attention to them than they deserve, you will miss the larger issue. The issue that came ashore with the French and the English and the Spanish, the issue that was the raison d'etre for each of the colonies, the issue that has made its way from coast to coast to coast and is with us today, the issue that has never changed, never varied, never faltered in its resolve is the issue of land. The issue has always been land. It will always be land until there isn't a square foot of land left in North America that is controlled by Native people. At the Lake Mohonk Conference in October of 1886, one of the participants, Charles Cornelius Coffin Painter, who served as a lobbyist for the Indian Rights Association, pointed out the obvious that the treaties made with native people had been little more than expediencies. In his talk, Painter quoted General William Tecumseh Sherman, who had said that treaties were never made to be kept, but to serve a present purpose, to settle a present difficulty in the easiest manner possible, to acquire a desired good with the least possible compensation, and then to be disregarded as soon as this purpose was tainted and we were strong enough to enforce a new and more profitable arrangement. This is the same General Sherman who philosophized that the more Indians we kill this year, the fewer we will need to kill the next. Painter didn't necessarily agree with Sherman, but he understood that the overall goal of removals, allotments, treaties, 
reservations and reserves, terminations and relocations was not simply to limit and control the movement of native peoples, but more importantly, to relieve them of their land base. Land. If you understand nothing else about the history of Indians in North America, you need to understand that the question that really matters is the question of land. Land has always been a defining element of Aboriginal culture. Land contains the languages, the stories, and the histories of a people. It provides water, air, shelter, and food. Land participates in the ceremonies and the songs. And land is home. Not in an abstract way. The Blackfoot in Alberta live in the shadow of Ninastiko, or Chief Mountain. The mountain is a special place for the Blackfoot, and friends in the reserve at Standoff have told me more than once that as long as they can see the mountain, they know they are home. For non-natives, land is primarily a commodity, something that has value for what you can take from it or what you can get for it. Helen thinks that this is a gross generalization. She believes that there are all sorts of people in Canada who have a deep attachment to land that extends beyond the family cottage on the lake and that there are native people who have little connection to a particular geography. I don't disagree. Individuals can fool you and they can surprise you. What I'm talking about here is North America's societal attitude towards land. The Alberta tar sands is an excellent example of a non-native understanding of land. It is, without question, the dirtiest, most environmentally insane energy extraction project in North America, probably in the world. But the companies that are destroying landscapes and watersheds in Alberta continue merrily along, tearing up the earth because there are billions to be made out of such corporate devastation. The public has been noticeably quiet about the matter and neither the politicians in Alberta nor the folks in Ottawa have been willing to step in and say enough because in North American society when it comes to money there is no such thing as enough. We all know the facts and figures. Carbon emissions from the production of one barrel of tar sands oil are eight times higher than the emissions from a conventional barrel. The production of each barrel of tar sands oil requires at least three barrels of fresh water 90% of which never makes it back into the watershed. The wastewater winds up in a series of enormous tailing ponds that cover some 50 square kilometers and is so poisonous that it kills on contact. It is only a matter of time before one or more of the earthen dams that hold these ponds in place collapse and the toxic sludge is dumped into the Athabasca River. Just as disturbing are the surreal structures that have begun to appear on the Alberta landscape. Sulfur, a byproduct of the bitumen to oil process, is being turned into large blocks and stacked in high-rise piles on the prairies because no one knows what else to do with it. Predictably, these blocks are slowly decomposing, allowing the sulfur to leach out and spoil the groundwater. Yet, in spite of all the scientific evidence, oil corporations, with the aid and abetment of government, are expanding their operations breaking new ground, as it were, and building thousands of miles of pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, that will take Alberta crude from Fort McMurray to refineries and markets in the United States, Illinois, Oklahoma, and Texas, and in Canada, Kitimat, and Vancouver. I know, I know, there are organizations that have been fighting this kind of ecocide for years, but unfortunately, they constitute only a small portion of the overall population. To be sure, they have had the occasional success, but there's little chance that North America will develop a functional land ethic until it finds a way to overcome its irrational addiction to profit. Unfortunately, there are no signs that that's going to happen anytime soon. In 1868, the Lakota and the U.S. government signed a peace treaty at Fort Laramie which guaranteed that the Black Hills would remain with the Lakota Nation and that the Powder River country in northeastern Wyoming would be closed to white settlement. However, just six years later, in 1874, an army expedition led by, of all people, George Armstrong Custer discovered gold in the Black Hills at French Creek.
and before you could say Fort Laramie Treaty, white miners swarmed into the Black Hills and began digging mines, sluicing rivers, blasting away the sides of mountains with hydraulic cannons, and clear-cutting the forest in the hills for the timber. The army was supposed to keep whites out of the hills, but they didn't. A great many histories will tell you that the military was powerless to stop the flood of whites who came to the hills for the gold, but the truth of the matter is that the army didn't really try. By the spring of 1875, the situation had become untenable, and the Lakota went to Washington to try to persuade President Grant to honor the treaty that the two nations had signed. The Lakota wanted whites out of the Black Hills. They wanted the destruction of the forests and rivers stopped. They wanted the hills left alone. Instead, the administration told the Lakota that a new treaty was needed, one in which the Lakota would have to give up all claim to the Black Hills for the princely sum of $25,000 and that the tribe would have to move to Indian Territory. The Lakota refused to sign a new treaty. You can keep your money, they told Grant. And of the move to Indian Territory, Spotted Tail said that, if it, Indian Territory, is such a good country, you ought to send the white men now in our country there and let us alone. The Fort Laramie Treaty still stands as a valid agreement, and the Lakota have never given up their claim to the hills, nor have they stopped fighting for the land's return. So I can only imagine how they felt as they watched six grandfathers being turned into a national tourist attraction. Six Grandfathers is the mountain in the hills that became Mount Rushmore after it was renamed for a New York lawyer in 1885. From 1927 to 1941, the American sculptor Gutson Burgum chiseled and hacked and blasted the rock face until the granite looked remarkably like the faces of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. The Lakota, for whom the mountain is sacred, must have been particularly pleased with the dandy new artwork. Then in 1980, in United States v. Sioux Nation of Indians, the Supreme Court ruled that the Black Hills had been illegally taken. The solution, however, wasn't to return the hills to the Lakota. Instead, the court instructed that the original purchase price of $25,000 plus interest be paid to the tribe. After the long addition was over, the total came to over $106 million. $106 million. And as they had done in 1875, the Lakota refused the settlement. Money was never the issue. They wanted the hills back. As for the money, it stays in an interest-bearing account to this day. Alberta Tar Sands, Black Hills, so much for Helen's spurious objection. Oh, sure. Two examples do not a treaty make, and I'm confident someone can find instances where tribes have engaged in what could be seen as dubious enterprises in the area of land husbandry. In fact, let me help you. The Navajo and the Crow have leases with companies to strip mine coal on their respective reservations. The Cree in Quebec signed agreements that led to the damming of the Great Whale River for hydroelectric power. Tribes in the Northwest and British Columbia have parlayed their timber holdings and fishing rights into nascent economies. I would like to make the point that there is a difference between depredation and development, but I'm forced to admit that I probably couldn't draw a line between the two clear enough for all parties to agree. So Helen may be right. As for me, I still find it impossible to imagine the Alberta tar sands ever coming out of an Aboriginal ethos. One of the problems in any discussion about Indian land is that you also have to talk about treaties. In North American Indian history, land and treaties are so tightly intertwined that it is hardly possible to separate them. It is no coincidence, then, that while the relationship that Native people have with Canada and the United States contains both historical and social aspects, the primary relationship is legal. Remember our earlier chat about legal Indians? From a native perspective, Indian land is Indian land. From a contemporary, somewhat legal North American perspective, native land is land that belongs to the federal government and is on indefinite loan to a certain category of native people, 
To say that these two views are in conflict is to state the obvious. Indian land as Indian land was certainly the idea behind early treaties and agreements. But by the middle of the 19th century, new attitudes had taken over, and a treaty such as the one struck with the Yanktani Band of the Dakota at Fort Sully in 1865 stipulated any amendment or modification of this treaty by the Senate of the United States shall be considered final and binding upon the said band, represented in council, as a part of this treaty, in the same manner as if it had been subsequently presented and agreed to by the chiefs and headmen of said band. One of the great phrases to come out of the treaty process is, as long as the grass is green and the waters run. The general idea behind the phrase is not new. Charlemagne supposedly used such language in the 8th century when he declared that all Frisians would be fully free, the born and the unborn, so long as the wind blows from heaven and the child cries, grass grows green and flowers bloom, as far as the sun rises and the world stands. Great Britain, the United States and Canada, depending on how you want to count, signed well over 400 treaties with native tribes in North America. I haven't read them all, but none of the ones I have read contains the phrase. So I've always wondered if, as long as the grass is green and the waters run, was ever actually used in a treaty. I know that Andrew Jackson promised the Choctaw and Cherokee that, if they left their lands east of the Mississippi and moved west of the river, there beyond the limits of any state, in possession of land of their own, which they shall possess as long as grass grows or water runs, I am and will protect them and be their friend and father. And I know that over a century later, in 1978, David Sohappy Sr., a Yakima fisherman, said that he had been told by elders that the 1855 treaty with the Yakima had come with the promise that the treaty would last so long as Mount Adams was standing and so long as the sun rose in the east and long as the grass grows green in the spring and rivers flow. I'm betting that poetic constructions such as as long as the grass is green and the waters run, great white father and red children were part of the performances, the speeches, and the oral promises that attended treaty negotiations and did not necessarily find their way into the official transcript. While a phrase such as, the hatchet shall be forever buried, does appear in Article 13 of the treaty that Cherokee signed in 1785, I suspect that, in general, lawyers and politicians were not comfortable with metaphors. As a rule, easily understood language is not welcome in legal documents. Treaties, after all, were not vehicles for protecting land or even sharing land. They were vehicles for acquiring land. Almost without fail, throughout the history of North America, every time Indians signed a treaty with whites, Indians lost land. I can't think of a single treaty whereby Native people came away with more land than when they started. Such an idea, from a non-native point of view, would have been dangerously absurd. In fact, treaties have been so successful in separating Indians from their land that I'm surprised there isn't a national holiday to honor their good work. But we could fix that. We could, if we were so inclined, turn Columbus Day and Victoria Day into Treaty Day. After all, Columbus didn't discover America, and Queen Victoria never set foot in Canada. Folks in the United States would get a day off in October, just as the leaves were turning color in New England, and folks in Canada, perhaps even in Quebec, would get a day off in May, just as most of the snow had melted. We could encourage school children in both countries to memorize the top ten treaties in terms of land acquisition and turn that knowledge into a contest. Maybe get the Blackfoot to donate 10 acres of reserve land along the Old Man River as first prize. Of course, no one in Canada or the United States is going to support a holiday that isn't a celebration of national power and generosity, so we'd have to disguise it, much the way we do Thanksgiving. There it is, Treaty Day. I'd do my part. Read Robert Frost's poem, The Gift Outright. <laughs> 
sang a few verses of Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land as part of the festivities. Now I don't want to give anyone the impression that I think treaties are a bad idea. Treaties aren't the problem. Keeping the promises made in the treaties, on the other hand, is a different matter. One of the complaints that whites have had about Aboriginal people is that they didn't know what to do with land, or that they weren't using the land to its full potential. And North America has been quick to rally around the old aphorism, use it or lose it. Ironically, Canada currently finds itself in a pseudo-native position with regard to the far north. Knowing that the Arctic is a treasure trove of oil and gas, minerals and precious metals, and fish, the United States has been pushing jurisdictional boundaries, insisting that the Northwest Passage is an international waterway rather than a part of Canada. In 1969, the United States sent the SS Manhattan to sail into the passage without first getting Canadian permission. In 1985, the U.S. icebreaker Polar Sea did the same thing. Nasty words flew back and forth. One solution to this problem that is being bandied about is to strike a treaty, wherein the United States recognizes the passage as Canadian waters and Canada gives the United States the right to travel the waterway unimpeded. A treaty with the United States. That should work out well. Lost in all of this gunship diplomacy was the 1953 saga of 87 Inuit who were moved from Fort Harrison to Grease Fjord. The official reason Canadian bureaucrats gave for the move was that it would allow the Inuit to continue to live off the land and maintain their traditional ways. The unofficial reason was that Canada wanted to use the Inuit as placeholders in the continuing debate over who had territorial rights to the high Arctic and its resources. The government has always maintained that the families who relocated did so voluntarily, while the Inuit maintained that the moves were forced. Wherever the truth lies, it is amusing to watch politicians validating Canada's land claims in the far north on the backs of Aboriginal people. It's ours, Ottawa tells the world. Our people are there. When it comes to the matter of land, one of the key questions is, what is the proper use of land? This is both an historical and a contemporary consideration in Native rights. In the early days, hunting and gathering were seen as inferior uses of the land compared to farming. Where Indians did farm, their farming practices were considered inferior to those of whites. And these days, heaven help the tribe or band that wishes to keep a section of land in its natural state when a golf course or a ski resort or a strip mine comes looking for a home. Sometimes a close reading of history is helpful in understanding the question of land, and sometimes representative stories will do just as well. Personally, I prefer stories, and I happen to have several that you might consider. 1. In 1942, during World War II, the Government of Canada went looking around for a place to set up a military training base. Surprise of surprises, they found such a site on the Stony Point Ojibwe Reserve in Ontario, Ipperwash. The government offered the band $15 an acre for the land. The band refused and the government confiscated the land with the explicit promise to return it after the war. I should mention that wars have provided excellent opportunities for the theft of Indian land. The Stony Point Ojibwe were not the only people to have land confiscated in the interest of a war effort. In 1917, in the dead of winter, the U.S. Army moved the Nisqually out of their homes in Washington State and condemned more than two-thirds of the reservation. Then the land was transferred to the U.S. Department of War which used the gift of 3,300 acres to expand Fort Lewis and construct an artillery range. Further west on the prairies following World War I, amendments to the Indian Act in 1918 gave Canada's Department of Indian Affairs the power to lease banned land and give it to non-natives for proper cultivation. We would be only too glad to have the Indian use this land if he would, lamented Arthur Meehan, the Minister of the Interior and Superintendent of Indian Affairs. But he will not cultivate this land, and we want to cultivate it, that is all. But back to Ipperwash. In 
The war came and went, as wars will do, yet the land was not returned. Over the years, at various times, the Stony Point Ojibwe protested the original confiscation, and in 1996, that protest took on a new life. In September of that year, about 35 natives took over the park to call attention to the long-standing land claim. At first, things were reasonably peaceful, and then harsh words were exchanged. An Ontario provincial police cruiser had its window smashed. A band counselor had a rock thrown at his car. One story about a woman in a car being attacked with a baseball bat proved to be a fabrication by the police, supposedly for public relations reasons. The pushing and shoving escalated, and the confrontation came to a head with police firing on a car and a school bus, wounding two of the native protesters and killing Dudley George. I must admit, I know little about Ipperwash. I've never been to the park. What I know of the confrontation that led to Dudley George's death, I know from newspaper and television reports, and I have always had a problem trusting those accounts. But I did have an interesting conversation with a government official a year or so after the tragedy. I had gone to Ottawa to give a lecture, and, on the flight back to Toronto, I sat next to a fellow who was actually involved with the Stony Point Ojibwe land claim at Ipperwash. He had heard me speak and wanted to get my opinion on the matter. Now, it's not every day that I get asked by the government for my opinion. Helen hardly ever asked me for my opinion. So I was flattered. Ask away, I said. Ipperwash, he agreed, had been part of the Stony Point Ojibwe Reserve, and it had been taken as part of the war effort. And with the war long gone and the military training base dismantled, the perception, on the part of the Ojibwe certainly, was that the land should be returned. However, the official told me, besides the problem of public perception, the government returning land to Indians, no matter what the circumstances, was not a vote-getter, there was the problem of live ordnance. Because the land had been used as a military range, there were unexploded shells and nasty whatnots in the ground, which made some areas dangerous. What are we supposed to do about that? The official wanted to know. How could the government, in good faith, return land that was unsafe to the Ojibwe? I suggested that the government clean up the land and then return it. The government didn't make the mess, the man told me. The army did. Now, in my house, if you make a mess, you clean it up. Most of the time. Okay, I said. Have the army clean it up. They don't have enough money in their budget to do that. Then put the money in their budget. If we do, they'll just spend it on things that are higher priorities. It was a pleasant conversation, and the more we talked, the more I felt as though I were talking to a bowl of jello. By the time we landed, I realized that I wasn't being asked how the land could be given back, so much as I was being given a briefing on why that wasn't going to happen. The real problem, the official told me, as we sat next to each other on the plane, is the cultural recalcitrance of the Ojibwe. The hostile feelings, the takeover of the park, the killing of Dudley George, could all have been avoided if the Ojibwe had simply sold the land to the government in the first place. Well, that's certainly one way to look at it. Since that conversation, the government of Ontario, in 2007, did announce that it plans to return the 56-hectare park to the Chippewa of Kettle and Stony Point First Nation, though not right away. In May of 2009, a transfer process agreement was signed stipulating a full transfer of the land within a year. In 2010, legislation was passed to deregulate the park lands, a legal move that was supposed to be the next step in actually returning the land. By May of 2012, nothing more had happened. Though the cleanup of the old military base had begun, the bottom line remains the same. The land still hasn't been returned. 2. Kinzua Dam in the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania is one of the largest dams east of the Mississippi River. Work on the dam began in 1960 and was finished in 1965. The dam costs more than $120 million and is over 1,900 feet long and 179 feet high. 
The main purpose of the dam is to control the Allegheny River while, at the same time, providing hydroelectric power for homes and industry, and places for folks with leisure time on their hands to park their boats. The reservoir that the dam created is 27 miles long and has about 90 miles of shoreline. The dam created the deepest lake in Pennsylvania, around 130 feet deep, and at the bottom of that lake is the Seneca Indian Reservation. The reservation wasn't supposed to be at the bottom of the reservoir. The Seneca had signed a peace treaty with the United States that guaranteed this particular piece of land for the Seneca. Article 3 of the 1794 treaty allowed that the United States acknowledge all the land within the aforementioned boundaries to be the property of the Seneca Nation, and the United States will never claim the same nor disturb the Seneca Nation. That was 1794. So in 1956, the Seneca were probably surprised to learn that Congress had appropriated funds to build a dam on their land. The government had held hearings. The Army Corps of Engineers had briefed all of the interested parties, except the Seneca. No one invited the Seneca to the hearings. They weren't even advised that hearings were being held. They found out about the dam project after the fact. The tribe immediately filed a number of injunctions to stop the project and, at the same time, in a rather savvy move, hired two well-known engineers, Arthur Morgan, who had been chair of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Barton Jones, who had been responsible for the building of the Norris Dam within the TVA complex. Morgan and Jones were to look at the proposed dam to see if there was an alternative site that would serve the project without breaking the treaty and forcing the Seneca to move. Morgan found such a site, but the Army Corps of Engineers was not keen on changing their plans, and instead of looking at the new site in any detail, they forged ahead, pushing the dam project through Congress and condemning the Seneca Reservation by right of eminent domain. In 1961, the Seneca went as far as to write President John F. Kennedy, requesting that he terminate the project. I'm guessing that the Seneca supposed that Kennedy might be a sympathetic ear. After all, he had made all sorts of encouraging noises about civil rights and had lectured the Russians and other countries on the need to honor treaties. Just not Indian treaties. Alvin Josephy, in his book, Now That the Buffalo's Gone, argues that the Seneca had a large number of supporters in Congress who tried to get the dam site moved so the Seneca could stay where they were, but that the forces massed against the Seneca, led by the Army Corps of Engineers, were simply too great to overcome. I don't doubt that Josephy is correct, but I also know enough about money and politics to say that much of the public support for the Seneca and a good deal of the hand-wringing on the part of politicians was probably just for show. Treaty or no, I can't imagine that many folks in Washington really gave a damn whether or not Seneca land wound up on the bottom of a lake. I know that's a rather cynical attitude, but if you look at the history of dam building in North America, you might be surprised to discover how many excellent dam sites just happen to have been found on Indian land. Then again, Maybe you wouldn't. 3. The year is 1717. Voltaire is sent to the Bastille because his rather edgy writing makes powerful people uncomfortable. A massive earthquake strikes Antigua, Guatemala, and France gives a portion of land along the Ottawa River to the Sulpician Missionary Society. France doesn't own the land, but for the French crown, such matters are neither here nor there. The gift did not sit well with the Mohawk, since the land in the French grant was their land, and for the next 151 years, this piece of real estate would be a thorn in the side of Mohawk and Sulpician relations. In 1868, a year after Confederation had overtaken Canada, Joseph Onessa Canrat, a chief of the Mohawk, wrote a letter to the Sulpicians demanding the return of the land within eight days. The Sulpicians ignored the warning, and Onassa Kenrat led a march on the Sulpician Seminary, weapons in hand. After a short and rather unpleasant confrontation, local authorities arrived and forced the Mohawk to retreat. Then in 1936, 
the Sulpicians sold the property and left the area. The Mohawk protested the sale, and again, the protest fell on deaf ears. Twenty-three years later, in 1959, a nine-hole golf course, Club de Golf d'Oka, was built on the land, right next to the band cemetery. This time the Mohawk launched a legal protest, hoping that the courts would provide them with some relief from white encroachment. The authorities and the courts dillied back and dallied forth, and in the meantime, the developers went ahead with the construction of the course, and happy golfers began roaming up and down the fairways in their little carts. Finally, in 1977, the Mohawk filed an official land claim with the Federal Office of Native Claims in an attempt to recapture the land. Nine years later, the claim was rejected because it failed to meet certain legal criteria, which was a fancy way of saying that the Mohawk couldn't prove that they owned the land, at least not in the way that whites recognized ownership. For the next 11 years, Relations between the town of Oka and the Mohawk were spotty. Then, in 1989, the mayor of Oka, Jean Ouellette, announced the exciting news that the old golf course was going to be expanded into an 18-hole course, and that 60 luxury condominiums would also be built. In order to manage this expansion, the town prepared to move on the Mohawk, taking more of their land, leveling a forest known among the Mohawk as the Pines, and building new fairways and condominiums on top of the Band Cemetery. That did it. After 270-odd years of dealing with European arrogance and indifference, after trying every legal avenue available, the Mohawk had had enough. On March 10, 1990, natives began occupying the Pines, protecting their trees and their graveyard, their land. Five months later, in the heat of July, the confrontation became a shooting war. Neither the provincial government nor the federal government wanted to deal with the situation. Jean Ouellette had no intention of talking with the Mohawk and said so on television. Instead, he insisted that the province send in the Sûreté de Quebec, and in they came, storming the barricades that the Mohawk had erected with tear gas and flashbang grenades. Shots were fired. No one knows who fired first, not that it would have made much difference. And when the smoke cleared, Corporal Marcel LeMay had been mortally wounded and a Mohawk elder, Joe Armstrong, had suffered what would be a fatal heart attack trying to escape an angry mob. So began the Oka crisis. Very quickly, the Surete was reinforced by members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and the RCMP was joined by around 2,500 members of the Canadian military. Jets arrived, along with tanks and armoured personnel carriers. The Mohawk were joined by other natives, and for 78 days the two sides remained locked in a standoff. To say that Oka could have been avoided is an understatement. John Keisha, Quebec's Minister of Indian Affairs at the time, had realized the potential for disaster months before matters got out of hand. Kasha had urged the federal government to buy the disputed land from Oka and give it to the Knesetaki Mohawk. Of course, the Knesetaki Mohawk already had Aboriginal title to the land, had had title to the land long before France gave it to the Sulpicians, but Kasha's idea was, given the circumstances, a reasonable compromise. But rather than do something creative, or at least intelligent, local, provincial, and federal politicians stood around and pointed fingers at each other, and did nothing. The confrontation at Oka cost well over $200 million. In 1997, some seven years after the fact, the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development quietly purchased the disputed land for $5.2 million and gave it to the Mohawk for their use at the discretion of the federal government, of course. Anyone with a calculator can figure out that it would have been $195 million cheaper to have bought the land earlier, as the confrontation began to take shape. Of course, if the Mohawk land claim had been settled in 1977, the cost would have been minimal. Hardly more than a good dinner and a movie. But from Ottawa's point of view, Oka was never about the money or justice for that matter. 
Of the confrontation at Oka, George Erasmus, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations at the time, said, This is not going to be the last battle. This is not the last stand. This could be the first stand. 4. The northwest coast is one of my favorite places in the world. I've spent a good deal of time along the northern California coast, the Oregon and Washington coast, and in particular, the coast of British Columbia. I like the fog and the gloomy cool weather, and I have a long-lived love affair with the ocean that makes me prone to multisyllable adjectives. But if I were required to find a single noun to describe this part of the planet, it would be fish. Salmon. In fact, many of the tribes in the Northwest refer to themselves as the Salmon People. The salmon have been coming up the rivers along the northwest coast for millennia. They are one of the staple foods and figure heavily in the language and the cultural life of the native people along these waterways. By 1854, Europeans had settled in numbers in the Puget Sound area of Washington Territory. In that year, the territorial governor, Isaac Stevens, was able to impose a treaty, the Treaty of Medicine Creek, on the Nisqually, the Pialup, the Stylacum, the Squashik, the Squaxin Island, and other western tribes, a treaty that forced the tribes to give up most of their good farming land in exchange for $32,500 and the promise that they could continue to fish. One of the Nisqually chiefs, a man named Lesky, objected to the treaty and the loss of land. Skirmishes broke out between Indians and whites, and the conflict turned into what history likes to call the Puget Sound War. Puget Sound War sounds more dramatic than it was. Few people died on either side, but Stevens, outraged that the Nisqually would resist his land grab and angered over the deaths of two of his militiamen, sent troops to capture Lesky. No one knew for sure if Lesky had anything to do with the deaths of these two men, but it didn't matter. Lesky's real crime was his resistance to white desires, and on February 19, 1858, he was hanged. Whites were quick to take over the land that the Treaty of Medicine Creek had given them and slow to honor their promises, particularly the promise about fishing rights and for the next hundred years, the matter of fishing rights would be a continuing irritant to Indian-white relations. Any question about fishing rights should have been settled by the Medicine Creek Treaty, and if not by that treaty, then by two U.S. Supreme Court cases, United States v. Winans, 1905, and Surfert Brothers Company v. United States, 1919. In both these cases, the central question was whether Indians had access to the rivers of the Northwest and whether they could fish as they had been accustomed to fishing. And in each of the cases, the court ruled that Native people indeed had those rights. Yet in 1945, a 14-year-old Nisqually named Billy Frank Jr. was arrested for fishing on the Nisqually River. Frank had the right to fish, guaranteed by treaty. That right had been upheld in at least two Supreme Court cases, but for the next 29 years, that right would be ignored by Washington state officials. Maybe they were fans of Andrew Jackson. Just in case anyone has forgotten, Georgia, in the late 1820s and early 1830s, was hell-bent on removing the Cherokee from the state. Then, in 1832, the U.S. Supreme Court under John Marshall in Worcester v. Georgia, ruled that states had no power or authority to pass laws that affected domestic-dependent Indian nations. That decision should have put Georgia's plans on hold, but Andrew Jackson, who was president at the time and sympathetic to Georgia, pushed ahead with the forced removal of the Cherokee anyway. Marshall has made his decision, Jackson is credited with saying. Now let him enforce it. But perhaps Washington state officials weren't thinking of Jackson. Perhaps they just decided, like Jackson, that when it came to a matter of land and natural resources, a bunch of Indians, treaty or no, Supreme Court decisions or no, weren't going to set the rules of engagement. In 1954, a Puyallup named Bob 
Satyakam was arrested for illegally fishing along the Puyallup River. He was convicted, but in 1957, on appeal, the Washington State Supreme Court overturned the conviction. However, the matter of who could fish and who controlled the fishing was far from settled, and in no time at all, the rivers of the Northwest became the site of fishings as tribes pushed to have their fishing rights recognized and reaffirmed. During these fish-ins, Indians went fishing with a vengeance. Game wardens arrested them, destroyed their equipment, and confiscated their boats. While the Indians were fishing and the wardens were arresting, courts of various jurisdictions were busy turning out a flurry of rulings. In 1960, the Pierce County Superior Court ruled that the Puyallup tribe didn't exist. Another ruling denied the existence of the Puyallup Reservation. In 1963, in Washington v. McCoy, the court upheld the right of the state to subject Indians to reasonable and necessary regulations. The fishing wars escalated quickly. Hollywood celebrities such as Marlon Brando, Buffy St. Marie, and Dick Gregory came to the Northwest to help call attention to Indian fishing rights. The National Indian Youth Council showed up. Many of the fishing protests were led by the Survival of American Indians Association, SAIA, an organization formed out of the dispute itself. Neither side was willing to back down. Native people wanted their fishing rights as guaranteed by treaty. But neither the Department of Fish and Game nor the state's sports fishery associations were willing to allow the power to regulate any part of the fishery slip through their fingers. One of the fears voiced in newspaper articles and on radio talk shows was that native fishers would ruin the fishery by overfishing. Little was said about the destruction to the fishery by foreign offshore trawlers with their factory ships or the army of sports fishers who waited in ambush at the mouth of the river each year for the salmon to return. The idea was that Indians had no business competing with the commercial and sports fishery. This was never said out loud. It was just in the air. Certainly, this was the attitude of the Department of Fish and Game. And as Indians pushed to secure their treaty rights to the salmon, a strange dance began. Indians would push off in their boats and set their nets in the river, all of which, under the terms of the Medicine Creek Treaty, was legal. Game wardens would arrest, fine, and jail the fishers and confiscate their boats and nets. The Indians would go to court and the court would throw the government's case out. The Indians would claim their boats and nets and go back on the river. But the arrest and fines and court costs took their toll. Boats and nets were never returned in a timely manner, and many times they would somehow sustain damage during their impoundment. As soon as the Indians got back on the river, the game wardens would arrest them once more, and the great legal Mandela would begin to turn again. One of my historian friends, who wishes to remain anonymous, told me the story of his time on the rivers of the Northwest assisting some of the tribes with their fishing protests. He said that, after a while, the people would go out in the river with their worst boats and their worst nets. As soon as the wardens confiscated the equipment and were busy dragging the derelict boats and nets back to town, the natives would bring out their good boats and their good nets and continue fishing. The situation on the rivers became increasingly violent. Boats rammed each other. There were beatings. Folks began shooting at each other. On September 9, 1970, state law enforcement officials raided a large fishing camp on the banks of the Puyallup River. Sixty people were arrested, and the fishing village was bulldozed. No one was killed, but that was the only good news. And as one might expect, the question of treaty rights went back to court this time to the District Court for the Western District of Washington. United States v. State of Washington If you're surprised that the U.S. government sued the State of Washington on behalf of Native people, don't be. One of the legal issues in the fishing wars was federal jurisdiction versus state jurisdiction. Treaty land, let's not forget, was federal land. The arguments in the United States v. State of Washington were the same as they had been for the last hundred years. On the one hand, it was argued, the Treaty of Medicine Creek gave Indian people the right to fish. 
On the other hand, it was argued, the state of Washington had the right to regulate its fishery, regardless of any treaty. And when all the motions had been made and all the points had been argued, the district court, under Justice George Volt, ruled not only that Indians had a guaranteed right to fish, but that they had the right to 50% of the harvestable fish. The sound you just heard was the state of Washington passing out. In the end, no one won much. The salmon fishery had already been in decline, and that decline has continued. Offshore trawlers continued to take the lion's share of the salmon. The state, the sports fishery, and the natives have come to some tentative agreements to try to conserve the salmon, but with the new threat from fish farm diseases and the lack of regulation or responsibility in that particular industry, a once vibrant fishery may be on its way to extinction. 5. You like golf? I do. The Shaughnessy Golf and Country Club is one of the premier clubs in Vancouver. It's a private club, so unless you're a member or know a member, you can't play. The club had its beginnings in 1911 as the Shaughnessy Heights Golf Course, with a nine-hole course that was expanded to 18 holes the following year. The club didn't own the land. The 67 acres that encompassed the course had been leased from the Canadian Pacific Railroad. In 1956, the CPR began making noises that it wanted its land back, and the club went looking for another site. And in 1958, they found it. A lovely 162-acre site overlooking the Fraser River and the Strait of Georgia. Views, views, views. The only problem was that the land belonged to the Musqueam Nation. Actually, that wasn't really a problem. Since all Indian land and all Indian business was handled by Ottawa, the club leadership simply got together with the resident Indian agent and in a series of mostly private meetings negotiated a long-term lease for the site. The Musqueam had had little or no input regarding the lease. They weren't given a copy of the agreement and they had no idea what the exact terms were until 1970 when Graham Allen, a Department of Indian Affairs employee, showed the lease to Chief Delbert Guerin. Guerin and the Musqueam suspected that the golf club had got a bargain, so they weren't all that surprised to discover the deal had actually been a steal. While the land on which the golf course sat had originally been appraised at a rental price of $53,450 per year, the government gave the club a 75-year lease for $29,000 a year and locked that amount in for the first 10 years with no possibility of an increase. For the second 15 years, any increase on the lease could not exceed 15%. There's nothing like a government that's here to help. Nor was the government finished helping the Musqueam. In 1965, Ottawa, on behalf of the ban, signed a development deal with a private developer for about 40 prime acres of Musqueam land. The parcel was turned into a subdivision of 74 executive building lots, which were rented to non-natives for 99 years. Leases were set at about $400 per year for each of the 10,000 plus square foot lots and the lease prices frozen for the first 30 years with no incremental increases. $400 a year for a 100 by 100 foot building lot in the exclusive Point Grey area of Vancouver. $12,000 for the first 30 years. For 30 years, the Musqueam watched as the land around the leases skyrocketed in value, and for 30 years, the Musqueam were unable to realize a fair share of that market increase. So when the leases came up for renewal in 1995, the Musqueam tried to raise the rent to market value. Human nature is a rather predictable thing. The non-natives who had been paying next to nothing for their leases were angry that the rent was going to be raised and furious that the increase was going to be to market value. One of the arguments against this hike was that the houses increased the property value a somewhat spurious argument since the real value was in the land and its location and not what was on it. Just so we keep things straight, any other landlord or corporation would have raised the rates to market value with no questions asked. That's Real Estate 101. But the leases were on Indian land, 
and following the lead of Ottawa, the homeowners decided that Indian land was different from non-Indian land. Indian land, they argued, could not be valued in the same way as non-Indian land. It was unfair for the rates to be raised, they also argued, since they had no say on the Musqueam Council and could not vote in Musqueam elections, a creative variation on no taxation without representation. A Canadian friend of mine owns a condo in Costa Rica. He pays taxes on his property. He pays condo fees. He doesn't get to vote in Costa Rican elections. Another Canadian friend owns a small house in Fort Myers, Florida. He pays property taxes. He doesn't get to vote in that state either. Chief Ernest Campbell, in a Vancouver Sun interview, reminded everyone that, for the first 30 years, the tenants paid rents at very low fixed amounts. In 1995, tenants would have paid more to rent a parking stall downtown than for their home's lease. Annual rents were in the range of $375 to $400 or $31.25 to $33.33 per month. Low rents or no, the homeowners stopped paying rent altogether, hired a lawyer, and went to court. There was a series of court decisions, one in 1997 and one in 1998, but the one that counted was the 2000 Review by the Supreme Court of Canada, which concluded that Musqueam land, for the purposes of lease agreements, was worth about 50% of adjacent non-Indian land. At the same time, the court also suggested that if the band were to sell the land, it could be appraised at full market value. So in essence, what the court said was that land held by First Nations was worth half the value of the same land held by non-Natives. Still, good things come to them that waits. The lease on the Shaughnessy Golf and Country Club ends in 2033, while the leases on the estate lots will be up in 2064. I won't be around when that 200 acres of prime Vancouver real estate is returned to the Musqueam, so I don't know what they will decide to do with the land, but I'm sure Ottawa will help the Musqueam come up with something. 6. And while we're waiting, why don't we go for a hike? How about New Mexico? The population density is 16 people per square mile, so you won't be bumping into neighbors. The state has the third highest percentage of Indians after Oklahoma and Alaska. Among other things, the state is known for sandhill cranes, native art, Carlsbad caverns, balloon festivals, and atomic bombs. It's also home to the Carson National Forest a park in the northern part of the state that covers over 1.5 million acres and contains Wheeler Peak, the highest mountain in New Mexico. The park was created by Theodore Roosevelt in 1906, and to do so, his administration confiscated about 50,000 acres of Taos Pueblo Indian land. No treaty, no payment, no nothing. For Roosevelt, the land he took was simply land rocks, trees, lakes, rivers. For the Taos Pueblo, it was far more than that. When Roosevelt appropriated Taos land for the National Forest, he took Ba Waiya, or Blue Lake, a remote mountain lake that was and is sacred to the Taos people. Oral tradition has it that the Taos tribe was created out of the waters of the lake, and the area around the lake has always been part of the tribe's ceremonial life. Nevertheless, the park was created, and in 1916, the Forest Service ran a trail up to the lake and stocked the lake with trout for the pleasure of backpackers and tourists. Ten years later, the service built a cabin near the lake for the use of the park's forest rangers. The Taos protested the taking of the land and the lake. They protested opening the area to public recreation, without much success. In the 1920s, the Pueblo Lands Board, which had been established by the Pueblo Lands Act of 1924, awarded the Taos Pueblo $297,684.67, which was a 1906 valuation of the land that had been taken. The Pueblo countered, offering to waive any cash compensation in exchange for a clear and exclusive title to Blue Lake and the land around it. 
The Forest Service objected to the proposal, and that was the end of that. In 1933, with the help of the Commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, John Collier, who was the driving force behind the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, the Taos were able to get a statute passed for a 50-year permit that was supposed to allow them year-round exclusive use of the lake and the area around the lake. The Forest Service was none too pleased with this arrangement and, like many bureaucracies, was able to stall and delay and postpone. Finally, about seven years after the fact, the Service reluctantly issued a permit that allowed the Taos Pueblo exclusive use of the lake for three days in August. This wasn't a solution so much as it was an insult. In 1951, the Indian Claims Commission, which had been set up to hear and adjudicate Native claims, affirmed that Blue Lake had been taken illegally. But predictably, while the Commission had the power to hear cases and to recommend monetary compensation, it did not have the power to return land to any tribe. In fact, it was expressly forbidden even to consider the return of land. But the Taos hadn't changed their minds. They weren't interested in money. They wanted the lake and the land back. Taos elder Juan de Jesus Romera summed it up nicely. If our land is not returned to us, if it is turned over to the government for its use, then it is the end of Indian life. Our people will scatter as the people of other nations have scattered. It is our religion that holds us together. He might have gone on to say that the Taoist religion was in the land and the land in the religion, but for him that would have been stating the obvious. The Taoists continued pushing for the return of the land, pushing, 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 64 years of pushing. And then, in 1970, after more pushing, President Richard Nixon signed House of Representatives Bill 471 into law which gave back to the Taos people trust title to 48,000 acres of their land, including Blue Lake, and 1,640 acres surrounding the lake. 64 years. These six instances do no more than frame the issue of native land. I have not mentioned the Quinault or the Menominee or the Lumbee or the Silets and Grand Ronde tribes or the Claymath or the Passamaquoddy or the Blackfoot, or the Pitt River, or the Havasupi, or the Yakima at Warm Springs, or the Lubicon Lake Cree, nor have I listed any of the hundreds of land claims cases that are currently outstanding in Canada and the United States. Earlier in this book, I hinted that I didn't think that legal action was going to provide a solution to the problems that centuries of North American Indian policy and action had created. I suggested that the legal gauntlet created by legislation and the courts better serve the powerful and the privileged than it did Native people. I still believe this. But I do have to admit that in spite of such impediments, Native people in the late 20th and early 21st centuries have begun to find moments of success within the legal systems of North America. Perhaps, after all this time, the laws of the land will finally ride to the rescue and we will all live happily ever after.